All right. Anyway, everyone, uh, welcome, class, to Classics 160B1. You know it. You love it. It's Meet the Ancients. I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and we are in week 13, people. We are, we are dangerously close to the end of this class, and we just started the Roman Empire. Well, we're not even there yet. We're still like, we've got a dead Caesar on the ground. Caesar's not doing very well. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the aftermath of that. We've got an entire Roman Empire coming up. Um, so there's a lot of exciting stuff to cover over the next... What do we have? All right, somebody... Okay, what do we got? We got this week, right? Then we've got kind of, sort of a week next week. So we've got Monday and Friday next week. But Wednesday is Rome's birthday, if you guys remember that. So we're celebrating by not having class. And then, what, the week after that is, like, the last week of, like, actual content classes? Man. All right. All right. Um, well, we'll make it through. Anyway, I don't, I don't know why I'm getting sidetracked with that. Let's, let's fire this thing up. Bring down the projector. Turn off the lights. Fire it up. We've got lecture 13.1, The Battle for Rome, right? And if you're, like... Hasn't like the past like two weeks of lectures just been people battling about Rome? And if you've thought that, yes, you're absolutely right. All people are doing now is fighting for control over Rome. Remember how this started. Like, think back to the early Roman Republic. Think of how well-intentioned it all was, right? They were like, no more kings. You have one person ruling. It gets messed up. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. We got to put two people in charge at all times. And then 400 years later, people are like, two people on charge? What? Well, I want to be the only one in charge. <laughs> and that uh, is just kind of the way that it works for like the last hundred years of the Roman Republic. Like the most powerful people using their own military power to go fight other Romans. And it is an awfully bloody affair. So uh, we've seen a couple of these already, right? So remember, we started with the Gracchi, and they weren't really fighting other Romans, but they were trying some new techniques to gain power. Then we saw Marius and Sulla, and they were the first ones, right, to actually use their armies to fight against Rome. And then last week, right, we saw Julius Caesar and him going off into Gaul, kicking butt all over France, and then bringing his army back to Italy to do battle against the senators, kind of going all over the Roman world to do that. So that's kind of our second set of civil wars. Today we see the third set. So what we're going to do is we're going to recap a little bit with Julius Caesar. Uh, then we are going to dive into the bloody mess of the aftermath of his assassination. Um, little, little preview, little quick hint. Uh, the senators did not have a very good long-term plan here. And kind of the way that it works is they like kill Caesar and they're like, yay, we did it. And then they look at each other and then they're like, um, so what do we do now? And nobody really has any plan. Um, okay, so we will see what happens with that. And then we are going to see a new kind of group arise, a, a second triumvirate, if you will. And they are going to kind of be kicking butt on behalf of Caesar, right? They are going on a tour of revenge to avenge Caesar's death. And then finally, we are going to see the aftermath of all of this, and likely we'll probably pick this up on Wednesday. Um, we are going to see one person emerge at the end of this whole thing, uh, the guy that we know as Augustus, um, who is the very first Roman emperor. So let's go ahead. Let's see what we got announcements-wise. You guys know it by now. Put the screen into speaker view. You can see me. You can see the slides. Throw the questions at the TAs. They will type type the answers. And then one of the best announcements. You've got one more thing to write in this class, right? It is due Friday. After that, next week, there is nothing due. And then the week after that, uh, your project is going to be due. And one of the things we can do a little bit on Friday if I speed up my lectures a little bit, is we can talk a little bit about project formats. Um, and so kind of do a QA and a if anybody's got questions about it or, or anything. Um, yes, Rome did totally turn into a free-for-all match. The whole end of the Republic is just a giant like free-for-all. And 
it's just whoever can get power takes it and then kills whoever doesn't have the power and then they get killed and then they get killed and then they get killed again. Um, but uh, what we'll try to do is one of these Fridays, hopefully this Friday, spend a little bit of time talking about the final project and you guys can ask questions and we'll help you out the best we can there. That is due to two Fridays from now, two Fridays from now, not, not next Friday, but the one after that. Um, yeah, and we're almost, we're almost there. Okay, so let's recap good old, okay, the 30th, 30th for the, the project. Julius Caesar, right? So you guys know this, you guys have seen this before, right? He is born into the, the popularis, right? And if you get, so what we have, Jorge, is uh, we got an exam on the, the last day of class, right? So Wednesday, May 5th, you guys will have an exam, you'll do it on D2L. It's gonna be the exact same kind of setup that we had previously, um, where it's open note, but you're like kind of limited in the amount of time that you've got, right? So you'll want your notes really well organized. You'll want to study so you can answer some of the questions without the notes. Um, same sort of situation there. And what that'll mean is on May 5th at 12.50 p.m., right? You guys will be able to start focusing on your other classes, start studying for other exams and reflecting on the glory that is Greece and Rome because it'll be done. Okay, so uh, Caesar on his rise through the ranks, right? He's doing the same thing that the Gracchi were doing like 50 years earlier, 70 years earlier, right? He's like, there is power in the people and I know how to make the people love me. Let's give them some gladiatorial games, right? So he's building roads, he's building temples, he's throwing out gladiatorial games. Everybody's like, this guy's Caesar. He loves the party, he is a great dude. He's going into tons of debt to do this. Um, and as a result, he's got to make some very important personal connections to help him out. And so one of those is with this guy over here, Marcus Licinius Crassus, the richest dude in Rome. Remember we told the story about his fire brigade, right? They'd go like set buildings on fire and then try to buy the property from the owner while the building was on fire for like a quarter of the price. And then, you know, put the fire out if the person sells. Um, and then we've got Pompey, one of these very, very famous generals. Uh, in ancient Rome, one of the things Pompey liked to do is he kind of liked to give himself this little like uh, at, like mini Alexander the Great hairstyle. So he's got, he's got this like little like Alexander the Great thing going on up here. Um, and uh, early in his career, somebody calls him Pompeius Magnus or Pompey the Great. It's kind of like they were kind of like making fun of him, like that he was trying to be like Alexander the Great. And Pompey just loves the nickname. And he's like, I'm keeping it. <laughs> So we've got Pompey the Great, we've got Marcus Licinius Crassus, we've got Julius Caesar, and uh, they all kind of work together to get Julius Caesar the proconsulship in Gaul after Caesar got them like what they needed, right? Land for Pompey's veterans, tax breaks for Crassus, that sort of deal. So Caesar heads off and he's just killing people along the way. People are going down. He's bumping off into uh, uh, Germany, the first Roman general to do that. He's heading up into Britain, first Roman general to do that. Uh, and then finally, the Gauls are able to, uh, to mount a concerted resistance, right? The whole time previous, he's just going to little tribe after little tribe, and there's just no, like, like coherent resistance to the Roman advances. And it's Versen... What is it? There we go. It's Vercingetorix at the site of Lysia who's finally able to rally the Gauls, right, and put up that that concerted uh, resistance to Rome. But Julius Caesar starts building walls around the city. Then the, the reinforcements of the Gauls come in, and so he builds another wall around the Romans. Uh, and eventually, uh, the Romans are able to prevail at this siege. Vercingetorix is taken captive, and he goes and he rots in like a Roman prison for like five years before Julius Caesar actually makes his way back to Rome to like celebrate his triumph over the Gauls. So, Julius Caesar's like riding high after this, right? He is just like taking out like a million Gauls and then he's enslaved another million Gauls. It's like a third of the total population. The Senate back in Rome is pissed off, right? They're like, this guy is way too powerful. We did not give him the authority to do that, right? Uh, he only had authority to be in this one very, very small region. He got very liberal with like the interpreting of that. He's like, well, this other group is kind of messing with this one group. 
that's at the very, very corner of the area that I'm allowed to be in. So let's take over all of Gaul. Um, and the, the Senate is just not having it. But Caesar's got this problem, right? He is not allowed with his army into Italy. His like ability to have an army ends at the border of Italy, right? But he's got to get back there to get reelected. And uh, so what he ends up doing is he takes a look at his army and he's looking around and he's weighing the consequences and he's like, all right, I'm going for it, right? So he crosses the Rubicon in 49 BCE, right, with his army, illegally taking them to the city of Rome. He's declared an enemy of the state by the Senate. Uh, but guess what? The Senate, the Senate doesn't have an army at this point in time. They're all out in the provinces. And so the senators, right, the anti-Caesar faction here, they've got to flee the city of Rome. So Caesar marches on Rome. He kind of settled th settles things down there, installs some magistrates of his own, uh, and then he starts chasing people down. And in particular, Pompey the Great is hanging out here in Macedonia, and Caesar takes his army to go fight him. And so at this battle of Pharsalus in 48, right, we've got Caesar versus Pompey. Caesar is undermanned, right? Again, in, in hindsight, it's like one of these things like the Punic Wars where you're like, well, of course, Caesar's a military genius. Of course he won. Like at the time, if you were betting at like whatever the Roman version of the Las Vegas casino was, you would probably put your money on Pompey. Very, very well like uh, established general, bigger army, much more cavalry. Caesar sneaks his guys like into the reeds. Uh, <laughs> yes, Lucas, it's definitely Caesar's palace. I did not know how I missed that one. Obviously, you go to Caesar's palace for your casino needs <laughs> in ancient Rome. Um, yes, anyway, so <laughs> Caesar's, Caesar's best infantry are hiding in the reeds. And then when Pompey's cavalry, right, get over into that region, um, they end up surprise attacking Pompey's cavalry, taking them out and winning the battle. So Pompey's killed once he flees the battle, once he makes it to Egypt. And at this point in time, Caesar is the last of the first triumvirate. Remember, like 10 years ago, these guys were all like besties, right? They were like BFFs. And they were like, we're so awesome. We're the greatest Romans. Now, like Caesar has taken him out, right? Crassus got himself killed out in Parthia because he wanted to be a, a great general. He was not a great general. He was a terrible general. Pompey, right, uh, ended up turning on Caesar. Turns out that was a bad move. And Caesar is the last of them. And then he starts going all the way around the world, right? And so he stops in Egypt, and like, which is in the middle of a giant civil war at the time. You can hear more about it if you do the, uh, the pyramids and mummies class that I'm doing. Um, but the, the Ptolemaic dynasty was an incredibly long-lived successful dynasty. But at the end, they start fighting with each other, right? So you've got Cleopatra on one side. You've got Ptolemy the 13th on the other side. And Ptolemy the 13th, he's only like, he's only like 13 years old at the time, but he's on the other side. Um, and Caesar ends up teaming up with Cleopatra, who must have been one of the most like captivating figures in all of history, right? Her ability to both like kind of rule her people as well as like just captivate like the most powerful um, leaders in the Roman world is, is really unparalleled. So they defeat Ptolemy the 13th. Caesar moves on, he goes up into modern day Turkey, he's kicking butt over there, that's where he does his veni vidi vici, right? I came, I saw, I conquered, where he defeats the son of Mithridates. Uh, he goes into Africa, right? Where the senators who had fled from Rome, they're making their resistance in Africa, kind of old near, near um, Carthage, or what remains of Carthage. And Caesar dominates them over there, and eventually he gets back to Rome, all right? So back in Rome, Caesar starts um, being very liberal with what he's doing in terms of like uh, pushing the boundaries, I guess, a little bit in terms of what would be considered right or normal for a Roman leader to do. And so he does things like start renaming months after himself, starts proclaiming himself dictator for 10 years. No more of this six months being dictator. He's dictator for 10 years. Um, he starts setting up bronze statues of himself, particularly close to the statue of Jupiter. And then he says, hey, every time I'm in the Senate, 
I get to speak first. And then he starts doing things all over the Roland world, or all over the city as well, right? He's throwing a triumph for himself, not just for defeating the Gauls, but he's throwing a bunch of these for the Gauls, for defeating the Germans, for the, defeating the, the, uh, the Britons, right? And then also for defeating the Romans, which is super weird and not cool. Or at least the senators think it's not cool. So anyway, he's throwing another triumph for himself. And during the triumph, this is a good picture from HBO, HBO series Rome. Highly recommended if you ever uh, wanna watch the kind of story of the downfall of the Roman Republic. It's a fabulous series. It's only two seasons long. They ran out of money because it was super expensive to produce. Um, and it's kind of the idea of it is that there's, it tells the story of the fall of the Roman Republic, but like through the eyes of like two random soldiers of Caesar. Um, and so they, they pick these like kind of two guys who have a disproportionate influence in the outcome of this. But you see all the other characters, all the stories that we're talking about get told here with Caesar and Pompey uh, and the senators uh, and Cleopatra, all of that happens. And when you have your triumph, right, the general uh, paints his face, right, the color, the kind of royal color, um, and then is uh, taken in a chariot along this triumphal procession throughout the city. And you have uh, one of the slaves behind you here hold a wreath, right, like a wreath of victory over your head. But the slave also whispers in your ear, and he says, remember, remember you are mortal, right? For like a day or for like throughout the, the, the triumph, you're treated like a god. But you have the one slave there reminding you, remember, you are only mortal. Um, and Caesar's going to find that out all too soon. Um, but not before he does a bunch of other stuff, right? So he rebuilds, uh, he builds a whole new forum in the city of Rome. It's attached to the kind of regular forum, but it's all got all kinds of new cool Caesar stuff, right? This temple to Venus Genetrix, which translates as Venus the Mother, which just happens to be his great, 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 great grandmother, right? So he's like not so hint, like not so subtly hinting that he is like, he is indeed like the son of a divinity, or at least uh, kind of along that lineage. Um, he starts building new colonies and giving the citizens of those new colonies Roman citizenship. And so that area that he was in, part of Gaul here, he's setting up new things there. You can see these beautiful Roman temples if you go there today. Uh, this is the Maison Carré in the site of Nîmes. Where is Nîmes? Nemausus. There you go. Right there. Starts putting his own face on coinage, right? And people's faces have been on coins before, but not living people. And so that's kind of a weird thing for him to do, right? Just kind of, again, pushing the boundaries a little bit. Again, he changes the, the fifth month of the calendar, Quintilius, to his own name, Julius. We can see a Roman calendar or a recreation of a Roman calendar over here with the Ides of March right there. And he attempts to get himself crowned king, right? So there's this big performance in the Roman Forum where Mark Antony, his general, tries to crown him king and Caesar refuses the crown. And we talked last time about how there's that debate between like, is he really refusing the crown because he doesn't want to be king and he wants to show the people that? Or is he actually trying to, is he really trying to see how the people will respond, right? Is he trying to see like whether the people will be like, take the crown, take the crown. But twice Antony tries to crown him. There is no such chanting from the people and Caesar refuses the crown. But the senators at this point are, they have had enough, right? They are like, this guy wants to be king. The Roman Republic has one founding ideology. There are no kings in Rome, right? And so they have to very, very quickly plan this assassination because in like three days, Caesar's going to leave for the Far East, for Parthia, right? Um, which is where Crassus had gotten himself killed a decade earlier. So they get everybody together. They've got to get all the senators on the same page for this one, right? Uh, and then on March 15th, right, a series of 23 different senators end up stabbing Julius Caesar to death. And again, this is taking place in the Senate house that's attached to the complex of the theater of Pompey. So actually, this is a, obviously a more modern painting, but you have a statue of Pompey holding the globe in his hands. 
Um, and, uh, and then it's below that statue of Pompey that Caesar's killed, which is kind of ironic because Caesar ended up defeating Pompey in battle. Um, and once they were friends and we, uh, we talked last time too, about how important it was that Brutus himself did this, right? Not just, you usually hear about it because like Brutus and Caesar were friends, right? So it was this ultimate betrayal and that's kind of sort of part of it, I guess, but really the big deal with Brutus is that he was related to Lucius Junius Brutus, right? 450 years earlier at the end of the king, like the monarchy in the beginning of the Republic, right? It was Lucius Junius Brutus who kicked out the last king in Rome. And so to have his descendant, Marcus Junius Brutus, do the same thing 450 years later, right? Um, that is a, it's a very, very symbolic gesture. Okay, and finally we, conclu uh, we concluded last time, right, with the fact that you can still go see where this happened. This is the area known as Largo, Argentina in modern day Rome. It's pretty close, right? If you're staying anywhere in the historical center, you can go walk over to Largo, Argentina. So put this on your like list of places to go. And what you're gonna see is when you're looking at it, you're gonna see four different temple bases, right? It's like one, two, and then three here, and then there's four off the, uh, page kind of behind where my head would be, but you got to look behind them. And these are the foundations of that Senate building. That's where the senators got them. And today it's a cat sanctuary and it is just awesome. It's very peaceful and beautiful. And there are lots of little cute cats running around. Um, but there's another thing that I didn't talk about last time. Uh, there's also a memorial to Caesar. And this is actually in the Roman forum, right? So this is in a different part of the city. Um, and so if you go into the Roman Forum, you're going to see this kind of um, small little wall towards the north end of the Forum, I believe. Uh, and if you kind of walk behind that, you see the little memorial to Julius Caesar. And people like leave flowers there and they leave like little notes there. And it's a very interesting kind of thing, right? Because almost like the Gracchi, we have this question going through our minds, right? Like, is Caesar the hero of the people, right? I mean, he is one of the populares. When he goes through Rome, he is giving clemency to everybody, right? He is giving out money to the regular people. He's always fighting on behalf of the regular people. Those are the people who support him. And the question then is like, is he a hero for doing that? And kind of fighting against this oligarchic Senate? Or is he just another power hungry guy uh, who just wants all the glory and power for himself. And so clearly some people still remember him for his kind of fighting on behalf of the regular people. Um, so kind of a cool little monument. It's not actually his grave. So he would have been cremated uh, during this time. And so there, there actually isn't a grave with like his body anywhere, but this is the temple of the divine Julius. Um, so it's a temple kind of to his family, right? That clan of the Julii that traces all the way back to Aeneas uh, and, and Venus. Um, so it's the base of that temple where they have this, uh, this monument here. Okay, so, so that's the lead up to it. Our good guy, Julius Caesar, he has not made it through the Republic alive. So this is 44 BCE, right? Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the senators are sitting around and they are like, things are in chaos. They had they had zero plan of what to do. They weren't like, okay, let's kill him. And then we're going to do these like five different things to restore order to Rome and ensure that like the civil wars come to a close. It was just like, all right, like um, anybody have any good ideas on what we should do now? So what Antony does, remember Mark Antony is the main general of Julius Caesar. And so Antony freaks out, right? So he like tosses off his senatorial robes. He like cloaks himself like anonymous so he can be anonymous. And he's like, he runs out of there, right? Um, and uh, what ends up happening is that the kind of in the aftermath, the Senate parted themselves basically, but they actually adopt a lot of the laws that Caesar um, ended up putting in place. So Antony's running out of there, right? He's trying to remain anonymous. Uh, he's taken actually some of Caesar's bloody robes with him, and we'll see that in a little bit. Now, the question is, right, who's Mark Antony? We've talked about him a couple times. Remember, he's one of Caesar's main generals in Gaul. 
And then once Caesar came back to Rome, he installed Mark Antony as the tribune of the plebs, right? A really important kind of position for fighting on behalf of the regular people, and also because it has that veto power. Now, as it turns out, Mark Antony, fabulous general in Gaul, not a very good politician, right? So his like, pol like, his, like political leanings, and or not leanings, but it, his political maneuvering does not end up being very nuanced or productive. So we've got Mark Antony here, and he's fled the scene. Uh, and what he ends up doing is he ends up getting a hold of Caesar's bloody robes, right? And he starts giving these speeches. He starts giving these speeches against the Senate, right? Holding up Caesar's robes and trying to get the people to turn on the Senate because they killed the guy that was fighting for their rights, right? And he does this in an effective enough way that the Senate actually has to flee, right? The kind of people involved in the assassination have to get out of Dodge. So that's one of the characters in our story, right? We've got Mark Antony. Uh, he's giving speeches against the Senate. He was Caesar's main general in Gaul. Um, and uh, after fleeing kind of the chaos for a little bit, he is now back giving speeches against the Senate. All right, our second guy to know here is this guy, Octavian. So Octavian hasn't been a part of our story yet, but he uh, ended up being kind of like loosely related to Caesar. But Caesar ends up adopting Octavian as his, his heir, right? He got to know him growing up. He really liked the kid. He says, upon my death, whenever that is, right, you will become my, my heir to, to all that I own. Um, and so he's joined Caesar on a couple different campaigns. And now that Caesar's dead, right, he kind of reads the will and he learns in the will that he is the heir to Caesar. Now, this isn't a monarchy, right? So it's not like it's clear that he is the new king of Rome or anything like that. It's just that he gets the property of, of Caesar. Now, Octavian's got some thinking to do here, right? Like, Rome's kind of in chaos, he has been named the heir of the person who just got assassinated because he was acting too much like a king, right? And he's got to figure out what to do here, right? Like, should he take Caesar's inheritance like, and embrace the position as the adopted heir of Caesar? Should he just be like, nah, I don't, like, I don't need all this. Like, I just want to be a private citizen. Like, leave me alone. I'm not interested. Should he get out of here and like go find Caesar's legions and kind of like stake his claim and say like, hey, they just killed like my, you know, adoptive dad. Let's take the business to him. And so he's thinking through, um, ah, Hunter, that's a great question. So um, Caesar's son is, uh, is still out there, I believe. He dies as a kid, but I'm not sure exactly when. I think he dies in the aftermath um, after Caesar's assassination. Can somebody find that out for me when, when little Caesarion dies? Somebody check that out real quick. What do we have? Oh, okay, he was murdered by Octavian. Good for Octavian. <laughs> yeah, no challenges to the throne, Octavian. Um, okay, so he dies at like the, the end of this whole thing. That's kind of where we'll finish off our, our story today. Um, all right, so Octavian's got this decision to make though, right? Uh, and what he ends up doing is he starts by actually trying to get the Senate on his side. Right, so kind of Mark Antony's been talking against the Senate. Uh, Octavian starts by talking very Senate friendly, right? Um, and so he's trying to rebuild these bonds. He's saying, I understand what you had to do, blah, 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 blah. The Senate's like, all right, this is a, um, this is a good, seems like a good guy. They like give him a little bit of power. Then Octavian takes the treasury and he rescinds amnesty and he turns against the entire Senate. So this is where people start actually like going after all these senators, all right? So after Octavian has taken the, the treasury in Rome, he starts teaming up with Mark Antony, right? 
Um, so Mark Antony, Caesar's general, Octavian, Caesar's adopted heir, and then um, Lepidus here, Marcus Lepidus. And you don't have to remember Lepidus. Nobody, yeah, they hit him with the reverse card. Nobody cares about Lepidus, though. So second triumvirate, this is actually kind of a legal arrangement between these guys, and their number one goal is revenge, right? They are going to take it to anybody who is involved in the assassination of Caesar, right? Um, so they are going to try to prosecute them. They are going to try to do battle with them, whatever it takes to avenge Julius Caesar. And it turns out that what it actually takes is like an entire battle. And so in 42, this is two years after the death of Caesar, over in Macedonia, at the site of Philippi, uh, the Romans, or sorry, the, um, the kind of new second triumvirate is going to go against the old senators. And the new second triumvirate, they are able to outflank Brutus, uh, and they are able to bring um, Cassius and so the outflank Cassius and Brutus and bring the uh, the senators uh, the senatorial resistance to an end. And so it's at this battle in 42 that like the senatorial cause right. Remember they fought against Caesar and they lost there. Now they're fighting against the heirs of Caesar right. Antony and Octavian they lose there. And this is it the the senatorial cause the like fighting for the Roman Republic cause, th that's it. So, what they end up doing then, right, is after the victory of the Triumvirate, they're like, all right, so they're like trying to like read their history books, right? And they're like, well, it looks like the problem is that when people try to share power, it goes really, really poorly. So let's just not do that. So what the, the, the Triumvirate does, is they just like they decide to divide everything and they give Octavian the West and they give Mark Antony the East, right? As well as Egypt down there. And then they give poor old Lepidus like a little bit of North Africa. But again, nobody, nobody cares about Lepidus. All right. So Antony's hanging out in the East over here, right? And uh, over there, he ends up meeting Cleopatra, right? the mother of Caesar's child, uh, and they end up hooking up. And now they become a thing, and Antony is like completely infatuated with her. Um, and he just starts living in Egypt. And back in Rome, um, things are starting to get a little bit weird. They see Octavian, he's like never in, or sorry, they see um, Mark Antony, he's never in Rome. He's always hanging out in the East. Rumors start to spread that he's just like a more like an Eastern despot or an Eastern king than he is like a Roman consul, right? Like a, a rightful Roman ruler. Now, over in Africa, Lepidus decides that he's going to break the truce and he rebels against Octavian. Um, this doesn't end well. Lepidus never really had anything going on. So Octavian defeats Lepidus. And he takes over that kind of part of North Africa. So they're still trying this division thing. And for a while, it works all right. Octavian's got the West. Antony's got the East over here. And this strategy doesn't end up working either, right? We've seen that when they all try to share everything and rule together, that doesn't work. We've seen when they split things apart and say, hey, you rule over here and you rule over here and we're all good. That also doesn't work. And so now we get the third big civil war coming up, right? So we've seen Marius and Sulla. We've seen Caesar and Pompey. And now we've got one kind of final major conflict between Octavian on one side and Mark Antony on the other side. And this all goes down, right? It's a series of other kind of little battles along the way. And Mark, or, uh, Octavian really starts to spread these rumors that Mark Antony is like, this guy is like an Egyptian king, right? He is not a Roman. He has forsaken Rome and he has gone like uh, totally Egyptian and, and married Cleopatra and all that. And it comes to a head at the Battle of Actium. So this is off the, uh, the coast of, of kind of like northwestern Greece. And uh, it's a naval battle between Octavian um, and Mark Antony and Cleopatra and, and the kind of armies of both of them. So this is the third and uh, a very long set of civil wars. And during that battle, 
Mark or uh, Octavian's actually able to surround Mark Antony's ships and kind of trap them and then start closing in um, the net there. Now, Antony and Cleopatra themselves, they see the writing on the wall here and they peace out. They take their ship and they, they just row away. They row back to Egypt. But they also know that their army has been devastated and this isn't going to have a happy ending. Right, so Cleopatra and Antony flee the battle. They end up going back home. They leave their troops behind, kind of like Pompey did at the Battle of Pharsalus. Um, so, you know, not a very good general kind of move. Um, but they know what's in store for them. So Antony himself, he falls on his own sword, right? Kind of stabs himself to death. And Cleopatra very famously uh, is bitten by the Egyptian asp, like a very poisonous form of viper. And she ends up dying as well. And now what we're looking at, right? Originally, we had Rome with all that territory. And then we saw the triumvirate defeat the senators at Philippi. Octavian gets the west, Antony gets the east, Lepidus gets North Africa, and then eventually, right, Lepidus rebels, Octavian wins. Mark Antony and Octavian go head to head, Octavian wins. And now for the first time in a while, we've got one single person in charge of everything, all right? And this is in 31, or yeah, 31 BCE, and um, this is a kind of completely different situation than Rome has had for the past 450 years, right? Remember the, the ideology, no kings in Rome, always two people sharing power. We've got one person now who is very, very clearly dominant over everybody else. Okay, let's go ahead and do attendance for today. Uh, April 12th, today's color is orange, right? So go ahead and choose orange today. And we will start talking a little bit about what Octavian actually starts doing to justify and solidify his rule in Rome. Is, civ is Civilization 7 even a thing? <laughs> no, it's not a thing. When is it going to be a thing? Okay. The color is orange. Orange is the color. Oh, thanks for the, the shout out about the class previews, Brody. I appreciate that. I started my Civ journey back in the Civilization 2 days. Um, the graphics were not great back then, but like, it, it's just so addicting. I mean, it's, the, the, that was the game, more than any other game when I was like, I don't know, 13 or 14, 14, 15, maybe something like that, where it'd be like, you know, one in the morning, and I'd be like, no, maybe it wouldn't be one in the morning, but it would be late, and I'd be yelling at my mom, and I'd be like, mom, just, one more turn, mom, one more turn. And of course, by that time in the civilization, one turn is like 45 minutes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it's an awesome game. Although I'm also very bad at it. <laughs> it's like, if I, if I do one of the lower difficulty levels, it's like fine and I, I, can, I can win or whatever. The second I get up into like moderate difficulty, <laughs> my civilization gets destroyed immediately. <laughs> Um, you'd think that being a historian and knowing the like historical developments of these things would be useful, but I got some work to do. Um, in AC Odyssey, do I have Sparta or Athens conquer the whole map? I, I, I've 
flipped back and forth between those all the time. I'd be like fighting for Athens for a while and then I'd just flip and I'd start fighting with Sparta. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Octavian. And, and we really need to emphasize here that, uh, that this is a weird and difficult situation, right? We've come out of three sets of civil wars. So we've got Marius and Sulla. That's the first one. We're talking around like 90 BC, right? Then we've got Caesar and Pompey. And we're talking about, you know, 50-ish BC. And then we've got Octavian and Antony. And we're talking like the, the, around 40 to 30 BC. So, I mean, our civil war in, in the United States, right, lasted five years. And it has all sorts of like followed afterwards. Imagine what's going on in Rome when these civil wars, I mean, we're talking like this has been decades Decades and decades of like major civil war after major civil war. Like you're going into the army knowing the people you're probably going to be fighting are other Romans. This is really crazy stuff. Now, at this point in time, after six decades of war, eventually the people are just sick of it, right? And so what ends up happening here is that more or less people are just kind of agreeing that like, this is, there are bigger concerns than the idea of a monarch, right? Civil war is a, a bigger deal. Oh, so the, the Caesar Wars, um, the, they're kind of going on, his, his conquest of Gaul is in the 50s, mm -hmm. and then his fighting against all the other senators and everybody else is in the 40s, right? So it's kind of the 50s and 40s for Caesar, and he's, he's killed in 44 BC. So... What ends up happening here is that the Romans get very, they're sick of fighting and they get very, very lucky that it was Octavian who came out of this whole thing um, as the victor, right? So what Octavian does is he gets in front of the senators that are left, right? A lot of them have been killed in these different battles, especially the ones who were very anti-Caesar. But he gets in front of the Senate that's left and Octavian basically gets up there and says, I'm giving Rome back to you, right? Enough bloodshed, enough civil war. Like, I'm restoring the Roman Republic. So he's using this rhetoric that he is restoring the Roman Republic. And he gives this power back to the Senate. And in return, the Senate gives all the actual power to Octavian. Right. So he ends up getting the power to basically do whatever he wants. But rhetorically, he's saying, hey, I'm restoring the Republic Senate. You guys have the power. And he does this. Uh, he does a couple other things as well. And one of the big things is he starts taking on some new titles. So he calls himself the princeps. Right. Remember, where Caesar made himself dictator for 10 years. Octavian's not going to do that, right? He's like, I'm not a dictator. I'm not the sole ruler. I'm the princeps, which translates as the first citizen, right? And then he's already the imperator, or one of the generals, and that's where we get our word emperor. So he takes the title of princeps as the first citizen. Um, if you guys ever read Animal Farm, it kind of reminds you of like, you know, everybody's equal, but some are more equal than others. So... Uh, Octavian takes the title of princeps. He's already the imperator. He says, no, no, I don't want to be dictator. He also takes on the title, or the Senate bestows the title of Augustus upon Octavian. So originally, Augustus is a title, and it translates as the revered one. And over time, this ends up just kind of becoming the term that people use to refer to him, right? Yeah, and Zach, that's a great point, right? The, the word prince also comes from, from princeps. Um, okay, so we've got Octavian being the princeps. We've got him being the imperator. We've got him being the Augustus, which kind of becomes what he's called. And as the Augustus, he starts going through and acting quite a bit of legislation. So remember the deal here, right, is that Octavian gives power back to the Senate, 
in, in words, right? Rhetorically, he's restoring the Republic. In return, the Senate is giving all the actual real power to Octavian, right? So there's a lot of window dressing that says this is still the Republic. In actuality, we've got a totally new form of doing things here, all right? And so with the rise of Octavian, with him transitioning from kind of being Octavian and the, the heir of Caesar to Augustus, we are getting the transition, we are getting the end of the Roman Republic, and we are getting the start of the Roman Empire, okay? So why don't we go ahead and we'll, we'll actually, we'll, we'll close with that today. And what we'll start with on Wednesday is how Octavian, or now Augustus, right? They're the same person, just different words for the same person, how he goes about like legitimizing his rule in Rome. This is a really tricky situation. The whole ideology was no kings in Rome. Now he's a king in Rome. He's got to do some really clever stuff uh, to make sure that people perceive him in a traditional light, even though he's got an entirely new kind of form of power. So we're going to talk about all those strategies uh, on Wednesday. And you saw the preview that part of it is that he goes through a big kind of set of moral reforms. He says all these problems we've had, it's because we haven't been being moral and pious enough. And so he starts providing some of those reforms uh, to kind of get things back on track. So we're going to start with that on Wednesday. I hope you guys have a wonderful couple of days. Um, you're going to start reading the Divine Deeds of Augustus uh, or the Deeds of the Divine Augustus for Friday. Um, and, uh, and I will see you guys all on Wednesday. All right. Have a wonderful couple of days. Bye, everyone. <laughs>